in this episode of It Came From My Side of the Laundry Room. We're going to dive inside of a long box and we're going to feel the magic and hear the roar on a new Toytastic adventure. So stick around. Hello and welcome to It Came From My Side of the Laundry Room. In this week, we're going to kick things off with what's in the long box. Uh, what's in the box? What's in the long box? Usually when I do the what's in the long box segment, I like to do it by random, by reaching in and grabbing a handful of books. But this week, when I reached in, I grabbed a nice handful, but there was a single issue of a great miniseries that I thought, let's just do the whole miniseries. Now... Anyone that knows me knows that I'm a big fan of Dan Brereton, and his Nocturnals comic, I have to say, to me, was very life-changing when it came about in my life. Um, now, Dan Brereton did a lot of work with DC Comics, and he was able to do a miniseries that he wrote and drew, or painted in his case, that was breathtaking and awesome and something that we had never seen before at the time. And it's a beautiful love letter to Kaiju and Godzilla and all those great giant monsters. And it's Giant Killer. Now Giant Killer is about, in 1999, which was when this was released. It, a meteor struck Mount Diablo in San Francisco. And when it hit the volcano, or hit Mount Diablo, it activated the dormant volcano that was inside. And in doing so, it released giant monsters. Here's a picture of the scene. And here's a cool picture of the giant monsters in question emerging from the smoke and ash. And just to place how old this comic is, look, Big Daddy. But in order to fight back this giant monster menace that has come about, they were able to find a fang of one of the biggest of the monsters. And they extracted some DNA from it. And in it, they created Jack. After he awoke, they taught him school his training videos here were watching kaiju movies and he was trained in the ways of samurai and bushido the fang that they found they fashioned into a giant katana for him and issue one starts off with him confronting the first monster ig which is number nine in the field guide I'll talk about the field guide a little bit more later. But here's a great picture of Jack. And he has this tail with a crab claw at the end. That he is a true monster, as humanoid. He's not just, oh, I look kind of cool. I mean, that's a glaring, cool uh, addition. Here he is getting ready to attack. This monster right here. <laughs> Game Boy Color ad. Man, I feel old. Um, but he goes to fight this monster and it shoots a breath attack at him. And unbeknownst to... Jack at this time because he's never been in combat 
he also has a attack but it comes from in between the uh, like fins on his head but he quickly dispatches the monster rush hour own it on VHS and DVD and that's awesome there's another great picture of Jack the giant killer but that is the end of part one it's a great primer into the world and now here is book two as you can see on the cover the female character and that's Jill And you learned that Jill was the one to make the field guide that the military and the world in general use to identify these monsters. Sorry, I wanted to see if it gave an explanation for this next picture I'm going to show you. But here are two of the monsters together. And it says that they were just frolicking in this river here. So I don't know if that's a mating ritual or they're just pals chilling out. But they stop what they're doing and look right at Jack as he's standing there watching. Oh, and by the way, the whole area around San Francisco is bathed in toxic gas from the volcano and everything. Here. Here's some... Uh, their names were Kaibosh and Shrill, and it was clear they recognized something familiar in the smell of the new rat in their kitchen. Like Eastwood in the old days, like Mafume in the Samurai Western, he waded out there amongst the pair of them without the slightest hesitation. A kid in swim trunks on a roasting summer day, Max among the wild things. You can see a good size comparison because Jack is much taller than a human and then you can see how big they are they pick them up then you get the one goes to eat them and then they get into a fight he gets thrown to the ground Oh, apparently it was a mating thing because Jack now discovers that Shrill has an egg clutch. There he is, zapping her. This cool head manga beam there. And Shrill got her name because she lets out a piercing sonic attack. Oh, this might be a little bit grisly for younger viewers, but here he is dispatching Kabosh the sword through the eye 
and then he takes out the eggs. Then we see Jill on the scene as she starts taking samples while in hiding. And then they meet each other. And she knows his secret name, which is Yochu, which means larva in Japanese, because he, uh, when he was grown in the incubator, he resembled a larva. And we find out Shrill is still alive, but Jill takes her out with one of her nifty crossbow quarrels and that's the end of issue two sorry this has taken a while but it's been a long time since I've read these Okay, we start with Jill on the run from a special agent after her. And then she comes face to face in her car with this Kaiju. And this agent seems very, uh, headstrong and dense because he's only out to catch Jill because she's on the run from the same agency that created Jack as they've created her too but she doesn't have any of the monstrous uh, abilities or anything he does so they saw her as a failure but she's able to walk around in the toxic gases like him and live. Now this big winged beast is named Tozom. And after he dispatches with the federal agent, you see him playing with the cars like they're toys. And it says Tozom like a toddler sitting on the sidewalk with a hammer. Or just ants, something to smash and to paste on the out of boredom. But the agent isn't dead and becomes a uh, undead zombie esque. Here's another. Kaiju that Jack is watching. Looks like Tozom shows up on the scene. And then they begin fighting. And then Jack gets in the middle of it. Banjax, that's the monkey one.
but jack beheads, band jacks, and then falls from injuries he sustained in the fight because he ended up fighting both of them. And we see Jill has some super strength here. She carries him to freedom. And then we see what the agent looks like now. That he got mutated from the spores of the moth-like kaiju. Here we see that there's now like death cults that worship the kaiju. This one they named Jotun, which is a Cerebus looking kaiju. I'm sorry if that is that coming out okay. <clears throat> With three wolf heads. As the death caught allows themselves to be eaten by him. Oh, that's her story. I was completely wrong, folks. She wasn't created by them. She was mutated in the gases as well. She used to be an FBI agent. As we can see, she's telling Jack her story. And then she was sent to the same agency where they kept monitored her. Here's a Cthulhu-esque one. See, that's what I mean. It's like a love letter to the monster movies, the kaiju movies, the giant monsters in general. Because each one of them's kind of represented in one way, shape, or form. Like this with Cthulhu. That's a nice picture. But, as we're a little bit more than halfway through here now. Oh, and look, they're saved by one. Here. This bat one. Very cool looking. But as we're more than halfway through this now, I have to point out that um, I don't remember this ever getting any play. I never hear anyone ever talking about it. Okay, the bat thing's name is Knox. He's highly intelligent. And it's a friend to them. So that was book four. Did I show the cover? Can't remember if I showed the cover to three either. And now here's book five. Let me come upon, here's that bad secret agent now. Followed them to Knox's cave. And Knox tells his side of the story. A long time to learn your tongue. I have been here so long, much longer than the others. There have been others like me long ago. Many traveled to the world of the man before this and through many ages. Six hundred turns around the sun have I lived here. There were fewer men then. To them I have been a god, and I have been a devil. Today I am Knox, I am a monster. The young destroyer, small, like the men things, 
and yet have slain so many of us, the men things must be proud. Which he res Jack responds, I don't care about that. Here's a great picture. The three there. <laughs> An ad for Gauntlet Legends on the 64. That was an awesome game. And Jill dispatches secret agent guy by throwing a rock and knocking his head off. That's pretty awesome. And all of a sudden now the volcano erupts and more monsters now arise. This one is now coming up over the rise and Jack asks Knox to take Jill somewhere safe. Of course, she doesn't want to. And this one's name is Lava Baby. And here's a full picture of Lava Baby. Jack hits him with his head beam. in for the stab. And then all of a sudden Knox gets attacked by this monster as they're trying to fly to safety. So that was the end of part five. Now here's part six. Which is a little bit thicker. And then this one came in January of 2000. And Knox is hurt and dies, but it def defeated the monster that grabbed them. And then here's the biggest of all the monsters, the king of them. As you can see, Jack, all the way down there. To how big it is. Let's see if I can find its name. Roar. Jack tries to shoot it and it just kind of slows it down for a second. Again, there's another size comparison. Here Jack sacrifices himself to stop Roar. Which then sets off the volcano in a weird rift that sucks all the monsters in and returns the area back to normal with blue skies. Wild Wild West. Wild Wild West.
and they think Jack is dead, but eight hours later, he crawls out of the volcano alive. And then he introduces Jill as his sister. The end. Now, another cool thing that came out with these was the field guide. And it had dossiers on all the different monsters, Jack and Jill, and some of the main characters. Now, I have that. It's just I have all of those type of who's who or Marvel Universe type of books all in another long box somewhere. Because I like to keep them all together. I mean, I'm a huge fan of those type of cataloged issues. But anyway, that ran really long, and I apologize. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, Giant Killer is a great book. You guys should try to find it. Um, I'm sure they have a collected. I mean, if you're into kaiju, into Godzilla, into King Kong, giant monsters, monsters in general, give it a shot. But here's a commercial break. It's a world of celebration, of stockings hung in expectation, of winking lights and wintry wonderlands. M&M's go with the season, moms and Santas know the reason, M&M's melt in your mouth, not in your hand. All the world loves M&M's, they're a world of pure milk chocolate joy. All the world loves M&M's, they're neat to eat, fun to share, a part of Christmas everywhere. They go hand in hand with fun for everyone. They're a world of pure milk chocolate joy. All the world loves M and M's. They go hand in hand with fun for everyone. M and M's chocolate candies. The milk chocolate melts in your mouth, not in your hand. <laughs> Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed it. And now, let's have a toy tastic adventure. We'll keep this Toytastic Adventure pretty short because I don't have a lot of these and only one of the bunch is one I actually had as a kid. The rest of them I picked up. Now get this. There was a church consignment shop that I used to frequent a lot and its whole shtick was you could fill up a whole uh, paper grocery bag for a dollar. And sometimes I really lucked out, and they had some great toys. And they had these three. They had Tigra. Still with his action feature. A little beat up, a little worse for wear, but it was a figure I always wanted as a kid. Always loved the character, and never had. So, great way to pick it up. They also had Chitara. Her action feature is still intact. She's in pretty good shape. And they had Groon. Action feature still. Ooh, ladies. Probably some Fortnite, Fortnite dance like this. But, um. Paint's a little scratched up on the chest, a little loose here and there in the joints, but great character, great toy, very sturdy. I mean, they're like a hollow, hard plastic, which if you keep monkeying with the arms, you can like snap them around and it'll snap this plastic, which happened to a couple of mine that I had. I only had three of them growing up, and they were lion -O, which he uh, suffered the fate of the broken shoulder, and the only thing I have left, which is kind of depressing and adds in insult to injury, is the Sword of Omens. Really beat up. I mean... 
but very happy to still have this. So I had Lion-O, Panthro, and Slide. Which, I love this figure. It... The character design for Slythe and the other reptilian men were... They reminded me of the orcs from the Hobbit cartoon for some reason. Something about the face. But Slythe came with this like a pole armed axe which I don't have anymore but cool insignia thing there on his chest action feature still works I believe oh there you go but he always sits up on my shelf he is one of my prized figures from my childhood and I wish I could tell you why but, <clears throat> excuse me, I can't. I mean, there's just something with the tail, with the spikes, with the face. I mean, the texture of his scales. I mean, it's a perfectly designed figure. And I love it. He's a great size and heft. Just love it. Now... I apologize again for the comics running a little bit too long and the toys running a little too short. But anyway, thanks for watching. It came from my side of the laundry room. Keep being rad, stay dorky, and we'll see you next time. Thank you for watching this episode presented by My Side of the Laundry Room. Please check out some of these other recommended videos, and if you enjoyed what you've watched, please hit the subscribe button. You can also follow on Twitter, like on Facebook, and read up on My Side of the Laundry Room at our blog. Thanks for watching. Until next time, keep being rad and stay dorky.